evening, everyone. Um, welcome to the uh, uh, latest in our Bartlett uh, International Lecture Series. Um, I'm Ian Gordon, I'm the Director of History and Theory in the Bartlett School of Architecture. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome Aaron Betsky to the Bartlett this evening. Um, Aaron's a really energetic person. He does an amazing range of things. He writes, he teaches, he talks, as we will shortly hear. Um, he uh, critiques and critics uh, things, and he is, of course, a curator. Um, he was educated uh, in Holland, to begin with, but then most of it, yeah. Uh, and has, I think, really been an extraordinary person in the art and architecture world as a curator. Uh, firstly in Rotterdam, then in San Francisco, and now uh, for the last five or six years, I think now, in, in Cincinnati. Um, also, I think that one of the things that, that I think has been really interesting about Anna's work is how he's always been willing to take on subjects and deal with themes that perhaps other people are, are, are less bold enough to take on. And I first met Aaron in uh, 1988. When I was a student at UCLA, really? yeah, a student at UCLA, and I think you, I think your words were, we were really young puppies uh, in Los Angeles. Um, but uh, he then, in the 1990s, did a couple of books called Building Sex and then um, Queer Space, which were really amazing books, which took on the subject of same-sex uh, um, uh, relationships in relation to architecture, and also gender in relation to architecture, at a time when I think. The, the people who are really otherwise dealing with those topics tended to be uh, political feminists, and it was very rare for a man to take on those, those subjects, and also to deal with queer theory and queer space. And he's gone on to do all kinds of other very interesting things since. But I think they're just indications of how um, bold and innovative Aaron has been in his work. So we're really pleased that Aaron Betsky is here to talk to us this evening. Well done. Um, thank you. Uh, the, I'm very happy to be here, and I should especially thank Brent, who is the person who made it possible for me to be here uh, by organizing the, what was it called, Domesticity and Sexuality, Con Sexuality at Home, Sexuality at home uh, Conference. For those of you that missed it, you missed a great conference, so just feel bad. Um, but he is really uh, the reason that I am here, so I, I am very happy to be here. Uh, a couple of caveats. First of all, if this was a normal lecture, I'd be inviting all of you to come closer and not be so uh, shy. Uh, but you might have noticed that starting around the fourth row, it is freezing. So if I start shaking or speaking very fast, you'll know because there's icicles forming. Uh, it's very strange environmental condition here. Uh, the second thing that I have to say is that one way to talk about what I've done is to talk about all the things I've done. Uh, the other way to talk about what I've done is to say that I'm a failed architect. Uh, in fact, back before 2001, when you could still make jokes, I used to write that on my entry form when I came back into the country under profession. I would say failed architect because I didn't know what to say. These days I'm an art museum director. In fact, I have almost nothing to do with architecture other than that I write a twice a week blog at architectmagazine.com. And I say that because what I'm going to show you is work that some of you, although I have to say this is the Bartlett, so maybe I don't even have to say this, uh, then again, that might be my biases about the Bartlett. But people perhaps outside of the Bartlett might not recognize what I'm going to show you or a lot of what I'm going to show you as architecture. Certainly not as architecture in terms of buildings. And so the easy way to say that I'm showing you this work is because I'm a failed architect. I'm trained as an architect. But other than working for Frank Gehry for a few years, drafting away and uh, trying to have my own practice. I've never worked as an architect, not since then. And instead, I have tried to pursue architecture in other media 
and through other means. And as one does, I try to justify that approach through theory and especially through a lot of things that came together with the thing that I am proudest of, quite frankly, which is the Venice Architecture Biennale that I organized in 2008, uh, which was, I'm happy to say, completely devastated by the architecture critics of both The Guardian and The Times, which made me feel even more that I was doing something right. Uh, <laughs> but in that Biennale, I argued that what we needed, need today is an architecture that goes beyond buildings. And the reason we need that is that, first of all, we have to get away from this notion that architecture is buildings. And again, I feel as if perhaps here at the Bartlett I am preaching to the converted, but I think there is a confusion that people have between those two words. Building is the act of building making a building, or a building is something like this thing in which we are sitting. It is a built fact. Architecture is everything that is about building. It's how we think about building, how we talk about building, how we draw buildings, how we theorize buildings. It is, if you will, meta-buildings. And so, of course, buildings are the most complete objects of architecture. But by that very fact, it is also very difficult to find architecture in buildings. The architecture is usually buried within the building. So if I were to ask you in this space, where's the architecture, you might begin to talk about the slight curvature of the walls, the different textures that are employed here, the scale of the room, and begin to critique it in that way, and very soon you would be lost. And if you were not trained as an architect, you would be completely lost, because you'd have a hard time finding the architecture. Buildings are, more often than not, the tombs of architecture. Not only that, but these days, it is increasingly difficult to make architecture through buildings. Because most of what defines a building is, are a series of codes. Building codes, life safety codes, but also, and what is perhaps more important, financial codes that weigh every expenditure and every aspect of the building in terms of the minimal amount of investment with the maximum return in the quickest possible time. Value engineering is one of the words for it. Codes of behavior, codes of appearance, and all of that make it so that the architect, rather than being the heroic creator that I think most of you might still dream of being, usually winds up being an executor who tries to wrest architecture from the building. A very contradictory idea that what you're struggling to is to resurrect architecture out of a building. And I have asked myself, is it not possible to find architecture in other places? Is it not possible to practice architecture by other means? And I have found that, in fact, we have all lived in an architecture of the imagination that we have seen in movies and television or in our minds. When we go and see what we think of as powerful architecture, either powerfully good or bad, we're usually talking about interiors, about restaurants or sometimes domestic interiors, even though most architects have a very lowly opinion of interior design. Or we see it in landscapes, where spaces are shaped so much more powerfully and with so much more seeming freedom than they are in buildings. We see architecture appear for a moment in various places at various times, and it hits us over the head. It is evident. It reveals spatial characteristic. It reveals the way in which architecture structures our lives, in a way that architecture can be the shaping of the human environment in a conscious manner. 
can be that which mediates between us and others and the world outside, can be the making of a stage on which we can play the role that we would like to play. All of that is possible through architecture, but maybe not through building. Finally, the title of tonight's lecture is Architecture in a Floating World. And that's because not only are there all those codes that confront you in the making of a building, but we live in a world that is characterized by nothing so much as change and ephemerality, by the continual movement of goods and people and services, by the ubiquity of information and imagery, by the complete ephemeralization of how things work, my disembodied voice being just one example of it as I sit here being wired up by all kinds of devices. We have no sense anymore of the structure and the mechanics of a world in which, ironically, because so many things move, nothing in the actual actualization moves itself. We live, indeed, in a world that appears to be floating. The floating word, however, is also a reference to the late 18th and 19th century Japanese world at the edge of the city, literally floating on barges and piers, which were the places where order fell apart. And my argument that I will try to make in a few images tonight is that for this world of ephemerality, what we need is a kind of anchor, a series of images and objects and spaces that cannot be fixed, that cannot be monumental and lasting, that cannot, I believe, inhere in buildings, but that must serve to give us some sense of where we are, to create that which we might think of as architecture. And a final point I'll try to make is that more and more I am convinced that we must make such an architecture not by inventing new forms, not by making the always new, but rather by gathering together what already exists as objects, as images, as ideas, and repositioning and remaking rather than making new. So let me just show you a few things, and I get to give you a good nap by turning off the lights. Off. There we go. It's so great to have that power. Um, have a good sleep. Um, the it's way up there. OK, I hope I can, let's see, there. Um, so this is the world that we live in. And I would say that it's no accident that architecture, as we traditionally spell it out, is flailing around, is trying ever new ways of contorting itself. And this is a wonderful array of examples uh, that was put out by an architecture office uh, based in Beijing, uh, itself a sort of sample of the floating world. I think one partner is Portuguese, the other is English, I believe, and they have an office in uh, Beijing. And they did this wonderful lexicon of loop buildings and slab buildings and inverted pyramids and mountain ranges and stacked blocks and all the other ways in which we try to organize and make sense of the world all around us. We are pushing at the very limits of buildings, both because we have found that these objects are not efficient and not pleasing, but also, quite frankly, because we are desperately trying to make architecture out of buildings without much effect. We are creating these con con contorted and convoluted structures uh, 
that are essentially only there for play. I do not want to say that all of this is bad. In fact, I would argue that there are some architects out there who are doing a pretty good job mining the possibilities of this autonomous monumental building for its iconic possibilities. And I would cite uh, Bjark Ingels, who I think is probably the most successful at that. I, in fact, I had one student write me a paper last year uh, whose title was uh, How Bjark Ingels is Going to Save the World of Architecture. Uh, and if the world of architecture is inherent in the making of buildings, I think that there's probably no better candidate for someone uh, who is going to do that than Bjark Ingels. We also, of course, are trying to figure out how to, try, how to make buildings that are no longer these incredible wastes of energy uh, because, and I say this not just to pay lip service to it, it is also, and I should have said this earlier, evident that the reason why we should not make buildings is that we should just not make buildings. We do not need more buildings and we cannot afford to use up more natural resources. And so the defensive answer to this is, are things like Mazdar City by Lord Foster, or the formerly Lord Foster, uh, and his associates creating what is attempting to be an eco-city out in the desert. And I certainly continue to be excited uh, by the possibilities of architecture inherent in form. Uh, this is a project uh, that was produced by Neil Denari for a competition that I judged in Keelung in Taiwan recently. And one still finds uh, the grand priests and priestesses of architecture uh, creating these rather sexy forms, these rather beautifully composed forms uh, throughout the world. Although, truth be told, the most effective of these and the most uh, expressive are very bad buildings in that the spaces they make that are actually built uh, in closed forms are horrible, but that are very expressive forms of infrastructure. I always like to say that people like Calatrava are only good from the waist up. They flail their arms around a lot, and everything below that you really don't want to see too much. What is most interesting to me is that the most thoughtful architects, I think, are, are, are undressing themselves, um, are in fact stripping themselves down uh, to the bare minimum. And if I were asked today what is the most significant structure being built today, I would probably point to this. This is the mothership, or if you will, the Death Star. This is the ultimate building being built today. Some of you might recognize it. It is also the ultimate building because it is the headquarters of Apple, which we know is the most important entity in the world. It certainly is by far the most profitable, and it owns probably a piece of just about everyone in this room. This is its Death Star. This is where the empire resides. And what is it? It is, of course, this perfect expression of endless nothingness. The Dilbert Corridor in infinity. The Panopticon with the dead Stephen Jobs buried in the middle rather than an overseer. The complete, endless, affectless space floating over a reconstructed forest in the middle of the suburbs. That is what architecture, if it wants to make buildings, I think does best today. This is what it does in reality. This is the Apple Store in Grand Central Station in New York. For any of you that have been to an Apple Store, you might have noticed there's not a lot of architecture there. And this is if you will, the ultimate statement, because there's no building here. The Apple Store in Grand Central Station in New York is a series of tables wired to the max and a series of people walking around with handheld devices to take your credit card and a closet in the back where they store the goodies. There's no barrier. There's no enclosure. There's no framing. 
There's none of the things that we think architecture should do, other than, of course, reveal the magnificent of an architecture that itself was at the beginning of the dissolution of architecture in the favor of movement, because the Warren and Wetmore building was designed to be an intersection of movement, open and porous. I call the kind of Apple-inspired modernism that we live in today W modernism. I would, have sto I would have chosen Zara modernism, but I was advised I would get into trouble because they litigate. Uh, also, it's very hard to take photographs or get photographs of Zara stores. The basic idea is that if you're going to do a building now, if you're going to try to make architecture, this is the default mechanism. This is what architecture can achieve. A kind of bland, efficient, modernist structure, which is to say abstract, more or less mass-produced, without scale or texture, that on its interior dissolves edges, creates empty frames, and allows for a sense of focus purely through hidden sources and hidden means of mechanical manipulation. In that world, it creates a great deal of comfort. We live in this kind of default modernism world, at least those of us who can afford a couple of hundred dollars a night to live even temporarily in that kind of room. This is what architecture does best today. And its temple and its symbol to me is the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And I say that seriously because, in fact, the Museum of Modern Art's mission is to define modernism. And I know that we have Frédéric Migrou here who probably could do a better job defining modernism from an institutional standpoint, but the Museum of Modern Art actually says in their mission statement, we define what modernism is. We are modernism. And they say that for art as well as for architecture. And when they hired a mediocre but very smart architect to do their new extension, uh, this architect was smart enough to go to them and say, thank you very much for this billion dollar job. Uh, well, then it was only a $500 million job. Thank you very much. Um, I will make you a nice building. If you give me more money, I will make you a beautiful building. And if you give me enough money, I will make your building go away. I will make architecture become completely without affect or presence. And they gave him all the money he needed. They spent about a billion dollars on this one building. With the result that you have a building that is neither good nor bad, just barely present. But that, of course, is in the great modernist tradition. It is inherent in modernism, and I'm certainly not the first person to point this out. Manfredo Tanfuri pointed this out 40 years ago. It is inherent in architecture that it realizes its own lack of meaning and effect, and that it destroys itself, that it tends towards its own disillusion and disappearance. That architecture as building disappears as buildings, becomes nothing but white walls and skylights. Now what interests me is to use that as a starting point. Unfortunately, or perhaps fortunately, I think you have to again go beyond buildings to do so, to ask yourself the question, what can be constructed that we might call architecture out of an architecture that disappears and is meaningless and is a waste of time and money and natural resources, you can look at those people who have begun to mark that kind of empty space, who have begun to misuse it or to inform it. This is the Serbian pavilion, or sorry, the Polish pavilion at the most recent Biennale, a seemingly empty space 
that rumbled with the sound collected from all of the passers-bys and whose walls were distorted, as was its floor. There is a long tradition in the world of art of making us aware of disillusion, of delighting, if you will, in disappearance, of impressing upon us the contradictory notion of the building itself, and bringing in a sense of the infinite. There are artists working today who are infinitely good at bringing us the infinite in the presence of all that is around us, who can drink in all of the world, and I give you here an example from London itself, and pour it out into one particular place. There are artists who excel at making us aware not only of emptiness, but of what remains within emptiness, as Gursky did in this photograph. Perhaps most potently, an artist such as Hiroshi Sugimoto lets the movie play for its full length with the shutter open, with the result that the image displays everything that happens in our world, the complexity of our world, reduced to a modernist emblem of perfection, to nothing as the reflection of everything condensed and then makes you realize what remains around, what already was, what somehow inheres and endures beyond architecture. A very beautiful example of this was a recent project, and if it wasn't for the fact that movies always crash on PowerPoint, I would show you this as a movie, was this project by Doug Aitken, who took one of the most obnoxious monuments to the notion of architecture as a modernist monument, the Hirshhorn Gallery in Washington, D.C., and covered it with images all the way around 360 degrees, images that, with a soundtrack, spoke of love, spoke of memory, spoke of sensuality, spoke of endurance, and sang that whole building back to life. These days, of course, that nothingness, however, has to go beyond marking the disappearance of physical structures, physical enclosure, and has to confront the fact that we live in that floating world, that we are at everywhere and nowhere at the same time. And so, of course, the easy answer is to scrape away at the walls and come to realize that perhaps it was not science fiction, but that we live in a chemical world, a coded world, where in fact everything is made up of zeros and ones, that nothingness is everything at the same time, that everything does float, and so we need to make architecture out of that. Again, something that has a long tradition a realization in art and architecture that human beings themselves are being dissolved. That in fact, what we think of as human beings, which are supposed to be the mark and measure of architecture, it is about creating a human space. It is about framing the human being. It is about creating a relationship of the human being to others and the world around her or himself that that human being might not, in fact, be real. And so, one way to approach this floating world is to make it float, to go back to zeros and ones, to mark that nothingness, and to form those marks into, into lines of code, code that does not create buildings, but perhaps building blocks for other spaces that are hybrids between buildings and cars and bodies and sculptures that are clouds that could float over buildings that are perhaps intergalactic structures of which we today can only but dream. And certainly there are artists who are beginning to understand 
that such an architecture would be fractal, would not, as in the case of Matthew Ritchie, have a determinate scale, but could be anything from the microscopic to the size of the universe, does not necessarily have to have a place, but can be a weaving together of form and community that moves throughout our world. There is the notion that we can create new building blocks by mimicking nature itself, in this case, the way that bone accretes structure, that we can, and I'm actually not sure whether this is a Bartlett project, I thought it was, and now that I'm putting it up and looking at it, saying it might be from that other school just a little bit south of here, in which case I apologize. Uh, I, I, hope, I hope no one here knows, but I'm, I suddenly, as it flashed, I had that sense. Uh, anyhow, um, that one can, let's just flash by, uh, dissolve it. Uh, I thought I was being so clever by putting something from the Bartlett in here, and now it's, no, well, never mind. Um, certainly, there is this notion that we can begin to accrete buildings out of nothing, out of nothing but code, and that they can take on quite a large, uh, they can become quite large structures. There is the notion as well that, as in the work of Philip Beasley, it is possible to create an architecture that is a condensation of whatever is left that makes us human, our very breath, into forms that float and keep moving. There is the notion that we might be able to manipulate nature and the human body itself because this is an art, this is an architecture that assumes that in fact there is no barrier between the human body, a piece of fruit, a built construction, it all is just code. And the designer, the maker, the creator, is someone who manipulates code, who works in the realm of the almost nothing to deform things in what might more or less be the real world, the floating world, the assembly of continually changing images, perhaps no more than a blinking array of lights that marks a space, disappears, appears again, uh, fluctuates, pulses on and off, and begins to demarcate the beginning of a new space, a way of gathering all of that floating world into a kinetic experience, something that itself floats and reassembles and recodes the world all around us. Some of the most interesting architecture to me is architecture that works purely with data, as in this project at the Shenzhen Biennale, which took the data on population, population growth and the appearance and disappearance of plant life and animal life in Shenzhen and turned it into spaces and images and forms. There is a sense that we can mark our space that we, in fact, can tag where we are. At the bottom is a project that I was involved with for the Russian pavilion uh, at the Biennale again this year. Uh, this is a dome that has a series of codes that will let you into the notional world of a city called Skolkovo, which is currently being built on the outskirts of Moscow, and in which I'm the urban council. This sense that you have access to something not yet real purely by these objects. When this world really takes hold, we have to confront, however, the fact that this particular floating world is almost, again, disappearing, that it's not about physicality. And Vicente Gugliart and the students at the IAC in Barcelona did a beautiful and very poetic job of this at the 2008 Venice Biennale when they imagined the world of Internet 2.0 in which everything would communicate with everything and physicality would be replaced by transparency, translucency, and a series of marks. This is what architecture is becoming, a ghost 
in the machine, a ghost of its former self, a memory of physicality to which we refer as we float through our world. And yet, something remains, as in the outskirts of Sugimoto's photographs, as in the spaces that Gursky documented, as in that last little ghost image, as in the marking of empty space, the world refuses to die, attempts to shape it and form it might be difficult, but something remains of this world. And the task of architecture and of art for me these days is first of all to find and fix and reveal that world. I always loved this photograph because it was taken about a block away from where I used to live in Los Angeles on one of those uncommon days when it's full sunshine and clear air and you see the infinity of the mountains behind all of the mess of La Brea Boulevard in the middle of Los Angeles. And I looked at this photograph about 10 years after it was taken and realized that I had never seen that corner. I had never been aware of the architecture that consisted of the signs and the posts and the intersection of all of the happenstance constructions into this incredible collage that suddenly, but only in this image, makes perfect sense. It is photographers, especially today, who are able to catch the ephemerality of that world, as in Philip uh, de Corsa Lorca's photographs of drifters in Los Angeles, again, able to find stories and meaning within this world. What is going on in these kind of images? Why is the carton of milk exploding? Is it a reference to an annunciation or to some miracle that appeared? Is it a bit of violence that makes us aware of what is missing in this world? Or is it merely an excuse, a focal point that deflects our eye before it starts wandering onto the face brick, into that black crack, or up that staircase in the far left-hand corner. We begin to examine this world through the structure of the artist. X marks the spot, makes us aware of where we are within this kind of space. X gives the finger to power, to monuments, as in Ai Weiwei's photograph. Traffic cones, again in Shenzhen, temporarily mark a space, create an environment, answer to the meaninglessness of the code-defined buildings disporting themselves all around it. Sometimes it's as simple as cooking a good Thai meal, as the artist Rikrit Taranjave does, inviting people over for dinner, and then selling the leftovers as artworks. One of the failed structures in the 2008 Venice Biennale I commissioned was this project by Philippe, uh, uh, Philippe Ram, which was intended to create a virtual environment because the bottom plate was very hot and there would be a very cold plate refrigerated above it and it would draw the air up and create a cloud. Well, of course, the persistence of the medieval structure around it defeated that purpose. So he quickly, being a smart artist architect, changed his mind and instead made a déjeuner sur l'herbe, a kind of new disportment of people rather than of the particles of architecture. And of course, with a little nudity, he got more uh, publicity than anyone else in the Biennale. Again, I believe there is by now a tradition in this kind of architecture. It is an architecture not of making things, but of making us aware, of making us look, of cracking open that which is completely normal and unnoticed, that which appears to be nothing and yet sates us, surrounds us, and imprisons us.
finding ways to pry open Big Brother from his hiding place or the norms of domesticity through reversals and bad placements, even by mispressing a shirt, and I'm showing you work here by Diller and Scafidio, or by having a boar working on a track that over the course of an exhibition completely destroyed the wall to the point that it crumbled away. Architecture as x-ray, architecture as revealing and collecting and making us aware of what is otherwise hidden. Architecture as a cloud, a monument to floating itself in this pavilion that Diller and Scafidio did that was supposed to represent all of Switzerland. How do you represent a whole nation with 10,000 jets of water that create an anti-mountain, an anti-place of clarity, something that is misty, mysterious, that obfuscates, that makes us wonder, that envelops us. It whiz, in a sense, like a cloud floating over the bit of landscape that Catherine Gustafson created, or it is perhaps like a fish. This, to me, is a kind of emblem of what architecture today can do. Be a fish. It's a fish by Frank Gehry. It's a lamp. It is made by breaking things and reassembling them. It has no function other than to illuminate. It is, in some ways, a very personal object. Frank Gehry likes to tell the story that when he was a little kid, his mother used to buy a carp and put it in the bathtub where he would play with it as a little kid until she took it out and killed it to make gefilte fish, a traditional dish for the Sabbath meal. And he had to deal with that beauty and that death every week. It is also, for him, a form of research, a way of thinking about how you make a building that is not monumental, that is not perfect, that is not static, but that is as slippery and smelly as a fish. Architecture under construction, he's famous for saying, is much more interesting than the finished object. I would agree and say that even applies to his own buildings. It is, in fact, the continual desire to construct, not to build, to experiment, to make, to figure out, to recalibrate, to reassemble that I think is most interesting today. And some of the best of the structures are being made by reassembling, as I said earlier, things that already exist. By misusing disused objects, stringing them together, pointing them towards an enclosure of space, though perhaps never quite enclosing space, finding a way to create a complete environment that yet is open, the continual construction of a spiraling object that never begins and never ends, as in the work of the Starn Twins, but that just keeps building itself out into the sky. An architecture of shutters that open and close, move back and forth, as in this project at the Castle Documenta last summer. In the work of Ante Lu, the remaking of the air itself with an armada of air purifiers and air conditioners hanging over your head. The perhaps favorite project that I got to work on at the Venice Biennale I did was this project for the Estonian pavilion. Estonia doesn't have a pavilion at the Venice Architecture Biennale. It was not a country when the big countries already existed. And so instead, they proposed creating a reconstruction of the pipeline currently being built between Russia and Germany, between the Russian and German pavilions. It took a fair amount of politics to get it built. But when it was finally constructed, 
it was a representation of what we can't see as a sculpture, as an empty and useless object. That to me is more and more interesting, the marking rather than the finishing. Perhaps architecture can be just that marking or can be even worse than that, just making it worse in and of itself. Architecture, in other words, is unbuilding, not building. It's opening up, not enclosing. It's making, not constructing. It's the possibility of space opening up, appearing all around us. It is letting you see as well as reuse buildings that already exist, not hiding them, but revealing them. Even David Chipperfield, who otherwise makes not the most exciting buildings, did one of the most brilliant jobs at making us aware of what was already there. Everywhere in the world, in Moscow even, at the wine factory, some of the best constructions that I have seen, the things that get me most excited, are those that reveal as, we let, as they let us use these structures. Again, back in Hangzhou and in Shenzhen, back in China, in Beijing, places of art that convert former places of production into places for seeing, for the useless. It's here that art and architecture for me really come together because the final barrier, if you will, for this kind of unbuilding is the notion that we need to create functional structures. Yes, we need to make functional structures, but we don't necessarily need to make functional architecture. We need to make architecture out of functional structures, but we also need to realize that function, again, has disappeared into the iPod, the iPhone that you hold in your hand, to the screen that soon will be no more than a cloud, to air that should be flowing invisibly. Function has been replaced by use, by enjoyment, by emptiness, by consumption, by recreation, if you're lucky, even by sex. The rituals of, eat, of cooking have replaced the necessity of obtaining food, again, for those of us that can afford it. And thus, what we need to do, I believe, is to assemble what already exists all around us. And that, to me, is the other side of the modernist tradition. Let MoMA call for modernism as abstraction, as nothing. Let architecture kill itself as buildings and disappear. And let's pick up the pieces. And let's make something out of those pieces. That is the other side of modernism, the assembly of leftovers, the creation of something powerful, meaningful, a stage, a place for existence, by assembling leftover, disused, and misused artifacts. Everywhere around us, we see artists such as Matthew J. Jackson beginning to assemble such structures, or the work of Julie Meritu creating a mandala for the whole world, an architecture that sums up reality as Zaha once summed it up in her painting of 98 degrees. Or uh, uh, Mark Bradford, who takes all of the billboards and notices of the neighborhood in which he lives in Los Angeles, assembles them paints over them, scrapes away, puts more on, scrapes away, until he ends up with what he calls a map of Los Angeles, another Los Angeles than the one he inhabits. Or in Eliot Hundley's work, Deathless Aphrodite, Deathless Aphrodite of the Spotless Mind, taking 
little bits and pieces found on the street and creating a map of his world, or in Sarah Tse's whole universes that can cover and completely fill whole buildings, or these crazy alternative universes, not utopian proposals, but proposals for drag racing and for trains running around, for pure play. The replacement of the notion of making a perfect disappearing world with the joy in creating an assembly that is dedicated to joy or perhaps to dirt, to the beauty of what is disused and decayed and left over. The making of meaning in a very concrete way in the leftover spaces of Detroit, singing things alive with materiality, with color found on the street and assembled into spaces that can then explode back out. One of the most interesting artists working today is Theaster Gates here in his Dorchester project, assembling paintings, sculptures, performances, and yes, something that might even begin to look like a building out of leftover materials and using them to tell stories about the neighborhood, about African-American life, about craft, about all the things that he believes can create coherence, meaning, anchor in a floating world. An architecture of leftovers, of reuse, of abandoned buildings that now allow us to be at home in that particular floating world. An architecture that can be prosaic, that doesn't have to just be art. And I would say that even at the edges of possibility, there is the making of something that might be a static structure, as in the work of Wang Shu and the Amateur Office of Architecture, so richly deserving of this year's Pritzker Prize. In the work of the Rural Studio in Alabama, using leftover car windows and tire tracks and sandbags to create places out of which a community can be reconstructed. In the work of 2012 in Rotterdam, using again car seats and uh, leftover uh, tire tracks to create a temporary place for enjoyment, for fun, not necessarily productive, but rather a place to make you aware of the culture around you. Even leftover sinks and washing machines can be used to create this particular kind of architecture. Again, architects didn't get there first. Artists have been doing it, and certainly the designers in the Droch design movement have been doing it for quite some while. They are the ones who really began theorizing this almost 20 years ago now, talking about the fact that the last thing that we need in this world is no, more objects, and the last thing we need in this world is more ideas. What we need to do is to mine the history of art and architecture, to mine the world all around us, to mine our own minds and reassemble things. The thing on the bottom is perhaps my favorite, most poetic project they did. It was a proposal for a park in the former Eastern Germany where the idea was that this white form would be dragged behind a tractor in the fall and you would scrape and rake all the leaves and throw them into this object as the tractor moved by and it would compact them into this form and spit out a bench made out of the compacted leaves that you would sit on until the rains would dissolve it again into the ground and the whole process would start all over again. Assemble all of the logos of the Fortune 500 companies into this cross called the Bling Bling. Greg Lynn, I think, did the most brilliant project not when he proposed extraterrestrial objects, but when he looked at the toys that his children were using and that they threw out as soon as they were done with them and thought that by devising a computer program, he could form them into building blocks for furniture, for walls, 
and perhaps even for whole cities. This is an architecture that can make form out of FedEx boxes, that can reoccupy existing structures in a truly green manner, that can find a way to extend and make useful the slums all around us, that can convert the instruments of war into instruments of pleasure, that can take the skyscrapers that sit empty, the shopping malls that have become disused, and turn them into new places of either terror as abattoirs or as places of pleasure. It is the reconstruction of fictional worlds, as in the British Pavilion at the Venice Biennale. It is perhaps just the assembly of a Hawaiian shirt, a bus, a building facade into an object that cantilevers out over the street and over possibilities. The assembly of dust floating in the world to clothe the disappearance of buildings in this hairy coat of the reality of pollution in the city of Bangkok. An architecture that lets things grow all over it and disappears into that. And in fact, I would argue that the ultimate form of reuse these days is to reuse infrastructure, reuse the city we have by letting nature come back, by letting public space come back. The most successful and most beautiful building of the last few years is without a doubt the High Line in New York, the reuse of a place of production and movement as a place of non-production and movement, of pure enjoyment, a collage of different forms that lets you look at the city in a different way. I am attracted to this notion of creating public spaces out of the remnants of our industrial society, as in the Duisburg North Park. I am interested in the notion of a tactical urbanism that would take the leftovers of our cities and turn them into places that produce things we can enjoy. I'm interested in projects such as this by Pierre Huyghe, in which the statue of a woman became uh, encased in a beehive with the bees humming all around it, and the building blocks for the park became a place for philosophical discussion. The Angolan pavilion, uh, sorry, the Italian pavilion at the uh, uh, Venice Biennale turned into a moss garden. And in my teaching, I have been working with my students to find ways in which we can reuse historical forms. Here, a bit of a McKinmead and White library reused on an old shopping mall, clad with Christo, with nature turned into a place for feral cats, or another version of the same project, the same supermarket, turned into a market and a basketball court and a place to assemble art, or a way to make an architecture that is itself the assembly and continually recombination of objects and images. Perhaps the most poetic of recent projects of reuse and rethinking I saw was again at that Venice Biennale, and I apologize for making that the touchstone, but for those of you that have not been to the Venice Biennale, either art or architecture, you probably can find no better place uh, to find the assembly of some of the most interesting ideas than there every year. And this was a project by a Belgian collaborative of sociologists and artists and designers called Rotor, who asked themselves the question, if we are interested in the human-made environment, if we want to ask the question, what have we built? Why have we built? How have we built? What have we made? Then let's ask ourselves the question, what is the most artifice that we have created? And their answer was to take it back to the building blocks, not the pure forms displaying themselves in light, in, as Le Corbusier would have it, but rather the chemical compounds 
that we have used to make artificial materials, the true artifice of linoleum and aggregates and strange plastic with which we surround ourselves more and more. And they cut out fragments of these pieces from buildings all around and found that there were the marks of human beings, that by looking hard at and reassembling and reusing, not perhaps in a functional manner, but in order for us to see and understand and come to some realization of where we are in time and space, it is the cutting out of materials that works perhaps the best. The problem, of course, is that this too will be reused. Reused by those people who want to make money off of it. will become just more images that we consume. That unbuilding will become a style, has become a style. Collage already all was, always already was a style. We cannot invent anything. We cannot make anything new. We cannot expect either to find a way to be critical of the world all around us. If I am interested, ultimately, in how we can see and experience the floating world and make it our own in such a way that we can be at home in that world, that we can emplace ourselves in that world, that we can come to a relationship to our fellow human beings and that human-made world that surrounds us, then we have to come to the realization that that realization will be taken from us and will become just something that we do in order to get paid. But I remain romantic and remain in love with romantic images and their possibilities. I remain interested in the world that promises a future construction, perhaps in the ruins of today's construction. And I'm interested in the work of firms such as the Urban Think Tank, based in Sao Paulo in Zurich, and their notion that working with Iwan Ban, they can document the remnants of a failed modernism of the kind of empty boxes of absence, the meaningless disportments that architects work so hard and uselessly on, and find within them people living, people making things, people making a world for themselves, and that architecture, by realizing this, by looking at this, by photographing it, by thinking about it, and by acting within it, and acting with these people, can in fact begin to make something out of our particular floating world, can in fact begin to create building blocks that can anchor a favela in Sao Paulo. This was a project that I was very happy to give an award to, the Wholesome Award for Sustainable Architecture, when I was on a jury uh, last year, that is an empty concrete frame, the kind of minimal architecture in the form of building to which building has been reduced, that is a skeleton, a scaffolding that anchors this neighborhood and acts as a place for sports and arts as well as movement from people from the top of the hill to the bottom of the hill, that is a stabilization of an unstable terrain that does all the things that architecture, I think, can do in a building. So I leave you, somehow, strangely enough, despite what I promised you, with a building, with a notion that if we think of architecture as a way of understanding and acting in a critical way in this floating world, 
it might still be possible somehow to realize it in built form. Thank you.
the ability of uh, data to allow for assembly than I am for in its ability to create abstract structures. So that that is my particular bias, and that, in a sense, is also my argument with Patrick Schumacher. Uh, um, it is always a great fun to argue with uh, me. Yes. For instance, 
the group 212, of whom I showed a couple of projects, have developed what they call a harvest map, which is a software that allows you to map uh, what are materials in your area so that you can harvest them and reuse them. And one can imagine that one can begin to develop uh, codes that allow reuse much more easily. And I think for those of us that uh, remember the days even 10, 15 years ago when a project such as the Palais de Tokyo, which I showed, which one of the very roughly reused buildings, was very controversial also because how difficult it was to get it through the local building codes. Those have changed by now to allow these kind of things to happen much more easily. Um, so it is entirely possible that over time uh, those codes will change. Though, of course, I'm continually interested in not having those codes change, but in breaking those codes uh, and making things that are not necessarily the most efficient and functional possible. Yes. Uh, well, as I, as I tried to say, um, I, um, I think that you can use the computer either to create blobs uh, or you can use the computer to create harvest maps. And uh, that's, that might be what I'm more interested in is, is the latter. Um, I, and I think that the digital age is not just digital in terms of production, but again, it's digital in terms of its recreation of social relations uh, and of economic power structures. And I think that it behooves architects to not, as they always do, ignore uh, social and economic structures uh, in favor of the beauties of how you can uh, manipulate and reveal technology but rather to find ways of asking the questions, how do I build a world of Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and everything else, uh, rather than how do I build using Rhino? So these are kind of, it's a, it's a Thank <laughs> you. 
Yes. My question has been sort of floating, to be honest. I'm trying to fix it, and I'm not quite sure, but I'll try and phrase it. I, I, it's a sort of outline, so I think, psychoanalytical comment. I think you are in love with buildings. Yes, I, I would do that. You absolutely have to either emancipate yourself from it or confront it. Because you've shown more buildings in the lecture market than I've seen for a long time. And more of the generic buildings, too. You, know, you don't need to really see again the corporate headquarters. Even if it's the latest Apple, you know, absurdity, you know, sort of, a, sort of myth of perfection, sublime perfection. I think you need to see less architects, maybe, or less of architects, really emancipate yourself and break into new territory. Because even when you stop showing buildings in your lecture, and start showing other things, they tend to be objects, they tend to be neat combinations of the known, as you say, they tend to be dealing with concepts which are architectural, which is to do with symmetry, with antinomies, the way you structure it, speaking, is structured in a very architectural way. So I think you need to emancipate. That's the harshest criticism I've had. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you started it. You no, no, you're right. Yourself. You're right. You're you're right. right. I, I, I will only say in my defense that I foolishly uh, assumed that since one was speaking in architecture school, to give my audience something to hold on to, I had to show <laughs> buildings. And I like, I, when I speak in other venues, I show more things that are not buildings. But you're absolutely, uh, but you're absolutely right. Uh, that that's only a shading. Um, I can't I can't help it, and um, I think that I'll, I'll go even further than that, and I will say something that is I think truly um, well, I'm this, but um, I always have this sneaking suspicion that whatever we are producing today is not as good as what was produced in the past. Um, and uh, perhaps that it is the historian in me, but I think it is out of that despair that I tend to look for ever new buildings. Um, but I also have to say that all it takes for me is once every year or two to see something incredible like Wang Shu's China Academy uh, to fall all in love over fall in love all over again with, with buildings. So uh, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. I am addicted uh, and I probably need to go see a shrink. Uh, <laughs> but it's much easier to talk about it and have you say things like that than to spend hundreds of dollars a session on the you offering Thank you. You're offering Thank you. It's a very two no, you are absolutely right and you're also right about the way I speak. So I, 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 that is as I said probably some of the most um, jagger like criticism I've received in the end. Yes, one last question. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Of course, he couldn't just do it straight. Uh, however straight, I tried to get him to, to do it. 
But I think that to me is fascinating, this notion of just literally reusing not just building materials, but ideas and images. Um, and not pretending as if you are coming up with something new. I mean, I'm very, I hope at least I'm careful in my lecture, not to say that I invented any of these ideas, and to quote people and to make the lecture, if you will, into a kind of collage of ideas. And I would love to see more architecture or art that has that same quality of being uh, a reuse of what already exists, that is not afraid to be neoclassical, not in a neoclassical sense, but in a Warholian sense, uh, or even to be modernist in a Warholian sense. I think that would be a, a wonderful thing. If you'd like to start doing that, I will, I will come look at your work. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> I would debate it right away, indeed. Okay, I'm going to draw it to close. Um, Thanks uh, um, to the Bartlett for, for uh, inviting Aaron. Thanks to Brent for um, organising the Sexuality at Home event yesterday and inviting Aaron here. Um, thank you all for coming, and particularly those in the column seat at the front uh, for coming along. But mostly thanks to Aaron Betsy for sharing your thoughts and ideas.